Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event. Uh, I think this is a very special event uh, for all of us. This is an event on revisitations, uh, the long 1990s. And I think it's special also because many of the writers of this book in this book are intellectual witnesses and interlocutors of that time. Uh, and the second part of this is that many, some of the texts in this, in this book that we're going to discuss today which we'll hear, hear of more, were discussed in this institution very crucially. And some of them are presented in this institution. So CSDS is very happy to welcome all of you, welcome the speakers, and host this book, because we have a particular connection. So this collection of essays and images, Hunger of the Republic, are present in retrospect, edited by Ashish Rajdaksha, published by Tulika, distributed all over the world, represents, I think, a very powerful intellectual surplus of that time. Here, the effects of the 90s, the long 1990s, pushed well into current debates on democracy, politics, and aesthetics. So in what way do these debates frame what the book calls a retrospective present? What are the insights and limits of important ideas of the 1990s? So let's face it, the markers of that time are dramatic in conceptual and philosophical terms. 1991, the Soviet Union comes to an end. 1992, the Babri Masjid is demolished, inaugurating a political turn that is ongoing. Economic reforms, a new global turn in the capitalist world economy, again, ongoing. The centers of the world economy begin shifting to China and East Asia. We know what that has meant. The art market begins to expand rapidly after this boom. The internet begins spreading. The software industry races in India, unknown at that time. It frames. Here you see the temporal switch. It frames the contours of our current technological polit politics. Low cost video and audio significantly shapes cinema, music and arts practice. It also dynamizes politics, notably Hindu nationalism. In every sense, we as writers in this collection are not just witnesses and intellectual interlocutors, but I think at least for me, we are forced to rearrange our thoughts with this ongoingness of the present. So in this sense, the subtitle of the book is absolutely apt, our present in retrospect, right? So it's also interestingly a very interesting Chinese and Indian collaboration. So I wanna start my opening with this quotation. So this is a very nice book, China in 10 words. Uh, the Chinese writer Yu Hua looks back at the career of this concept, Renmin, which is the people. No other concept was so omnipresent in post-revolutionary China, he says. And he says it's Renmin suggests the arrival of a new political subject. But by the year 2000, in the full flush of globalization, et cetera, et cetera, Renmin, says Yuhua, is an anomaly. Today, and I quote, the already faded concept that was the people is sliced into ever smaller slices. Netizens, stock traders, fund holders, celebrity fans, laid off workers, migrant laborers, and so on, unquote. So Yuha's observation on the centrality and dispersal of a 20th century political imagination is in a sense, our revisiting and reframing what the long 20th, 1990s were. So there are kind of clear issues in front of us before I open this discussion, where the landscape of the political that the long 1990s leaves us. Is this one of representation? The shift from post-colonial to the contemporary or even the post-post-colonial from the narrative contract to the informational citizen? Sometimes even in the flux of that time and the shock of the rise of Hindu nationalism, there are really remarkable insights uh, on the relationship between technology and political aesthetics. This is something I'm interested in. By aesthetics, I mean a mode of sensing the world and sense-making. So way back in this time, and many of you will remember this essay, Tonika Sarkar uh, writes this remarkable essay on Sadhvi Ritambra, right? And she's capturing, this is 1991, you know, where all these elements are coming to, she's capturing this sensorial drive of Sadhvi's amplified speech. Then Tonika writes, and I quote, the voice seems almost about to crack under the sheer weight of passion. The overwhelming constant impression is of immediacy, urgency, 
passion, spontaneity, unquote. And she goes on. This is in that EPW piece. The cassette then is not a finished product, but one which grows with events. The spoken word addresses and the whole congregation and proceeds with this continual interchange of passion between the speaker and listeners. New technology is able to recapture that exchange ad infinitum for freshly or differently constituted congregations and at the same time allows the first message to fatten on new meanings and associations and the movement unleashed by itself growing from its self-fulfilling prophecies. And Tonika is a kind of historian of the older generation. It's remarkable. I, I think for me, you see this first glimpse of what in this very important book, Matthew Fuller and A.L. Weisman have called an expanded aesthetics. It's an expanded aesthetic, not cleanly framed, not constricted by sociological categories, kind of tipping over. But there are two tracks here. There are two tracks here. One is this recognizable set of intellectual shifts that all of us are familiar with over the past two decades, post Barbary debate on democracy, the idea of political society, enumeration, pain and collective trauma, the state effect and the informational turn, and this very compromised and stuttering dialectic of recognition in a liberal order and now breaking us under. Then, of course, there is this international debate, and I'm not going to go too much into that. The shifts after the linguistic turn, affect theory, new materialism, media ecology, post-colonial, decolonial debates, celluloid and post-cinema, the archive effect, and a general ecology after nature, as Timothy Morton calls it. And then for me, there is this problem of memory. There's a problem of memory, which is increasingly externalized to machines. So Pianora once wrote that the expanding emphasis on memory storage in the 20th century indicates a crisis of living memory. So Norris is a crisis of living memory, which is embedded from everyday practice. Frankly, in the 1990s, we didn't realize this. We just didn't realize, at least I did not. So memory has become a very, very fraught, really fraught zone now, which we thought was unique to humanity. You know, so, you know, Durkheim wants a society is memory. So, you know, it's a kind of different framing of this notion of memory, right? So let's go back to the 1990s very quickly before I hand it over. So frankly, when I was writing my essay in this book, none of these questions were clear. I was working, I began working on internet culture with what Zimmel would call a method of sociological impressionism. It's a kind of a sociological impression trying to figure out what is going on, trying to map a set of possibilities, conditions of possibilities via fieldwork. I was clear about one thing. I was actually exhausted with this endless focus on the state, and I was looking for answers elsewhere. I first circulated this text, which is in this book, in this famously chaotic, wild 1990s internet. It was read and translated and made it to an academic publication three years later. So it is kind of, it's, these things are possible. I don't know today, maybe they're possible, but it, it felt it was possible. And some of the ideas proposed became scarily relevant. I have a certain distance from what I wrote, like all of us after a few years. I think scarily relevant after Aadhaar, NPR, and the normalization of electronic surveillance. But at the same time, it was an intelligent wager. It was a really intelligent wager. In retrospect, this combination of digital networks and the financialization of our lives set up a kind of constellation of desires which frame this current landscape of the political. So in media in this moment, it releases the creative and indeterminate element, elements in memory making, uh, making what was once called the social highly dynamic. And we are still coming to terms with this. So memory capacities for action are now distributed, ranging from micro temporal to large political spectacles. The flesh of the Republic has moved, I think, beyond human sapiens. In the 1990s, it was human sapiens that defined the limit of the Republic. You know, it was, it, it was through representation, there were intermediaries, there were spokespeople. It is now highly technolo technologized. So we have to come to terms with this and still think about it. So for contemporary populist technological aesthetics, this actually is not a limitation, but a call for action. It is a kind of productive call for action. So this constellation converts the struggle for recognition I think, into one of digital reputation and value. 
So value has moved on to a different form. The same infrastructures that power recent social movements also power troll armies and populist aesthetics. Since the pandemic, we have seen the carnal ways in which bodies experience practices of governance, carnal ways, practices of governance, relate to and give shape to each other. In the context of recent social media, these bodies extend from human ones to non-human rhythms of news feeds. We just have to think of Sushant Singh Rajput and those whole moments. Uh, the you know the parameters of engagement with with through law through end user agreements uh, predictions decisions based on metadata which elections have become so what does this tell us so in a way we are going back to Rajni the question Rajni asks what does this tell us Rajni asks in the first chapter of this book democracy in search of a theory I think we need to revisit this question today in a sense for me this is what the book brings back and appropriately it frames it. So I'm, I'm not going to give the floor over uh, to Ashish Daksha, the editor of the book. And Ashish, who everyone knows in this room and outside, is a film scholar, art curator, cultural theorist, old friend. Um, uh, can I have the PowerPoint? So thanks very much, Ravi, and uh, thanks uh, many, many mutual friends around the, around the table for inviting me and all of us yet again to, to, to CSDS. Um, you're actually, uh, I mean, it hadn't, I have to say that I hadn't, uh, full screen cut. I hadn't uh, internalized the kind of connection with CSDS when we were putting this together. I'm quite happy to, to have it seen that way. Um, I, I just do a very quick, uh, quick uh, introduction to the series as a whole. I mean, the first thing is, of course, to say that this is a series of six volumes. Uh, and my hope is that one fine day, all the six volumes will be in front of us and that there will be a nice box box set uh, to be seen uh, as, as something that is, that is, a, that is an integral whole. Uh, but as of now, um, there is a sense in which even at this stage, there is a sense in which these volumes are larger than the sum of their parts. And I think as the volumes accrue, they will come to mean something else. That's the, 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 the assumption, at least, that, that one is making. Um, okay, can I have the next slide? Basically, right now, um, as we speak, we have uh, three volumes out. Um, what's happening next slide? Huh. These are the three volumes that are, sorry, uh, two volumes. That's the first one that you've seen, the second, uh, Improvised Futures, the third, The Vanishing Point, and the fourth, uh, Cities Untold, uh, Solomon Benjamin and the FF Collective uh, is um, in the process of production. Um, we have, over the last, uh, well, four days really, since last Saturday, had, um, um, okay, we have since uh, last Saturday had um, a series of events um, in um, <coughs> let's just wait for a second. Since last Saturday, we have had a series of events which have included uh, dancers, we've included um, theater people, we've included artists, filmmakers. Uh, we also had uh, significant conversations with, with, with fairly major political activists. And of course, today we're talking to academics. The point being to be able to expand the conversation um, well beyond the, the conventional sort of limits, if you like, of this uh, of this this inquiry. Um, as, as Ravi pointed out, the argument is really to do with the 90s, a period that we, at least those of us who weren't born after 2000, as some in this room may well have been, uh, who actually saw the 1990s, encountered the 1990s experientially, learned about the 1990s in the sense of how we learned how to, how to navigate the internet, basically, I suppose, which is what the 90s may have come to mean, or to do e-banking or something. Uh, but it's not really the case that we have been ha able to have sufficient distance from that time to be able to theorize it. Now, uh, it is a key proposition of the series that nothing is new. Uh, there is nothing in this book that is actually originally produced for the book. 
uh, although Solly Benjamin is having a lot of arguments with us over that one. Um, everything is actually in, in existence, but, but it is represented, it is restaged uh, in a context that may not have been that of, uh, that may not have been in the minds of the person who, when they wrote it or made it or filmed it or, or, or drew it. Um, can I have the next one? Uh, this is the the table of contents of the first volume, and I think uh, and I think uh, Ravi was particularly keen that we show this because uh, it's one book where I think you'll probably know half or more than half of the essays. Uh, some extremely famous essays, uh, foundational essays, if you like, of this particular period, but essays written uh, in very different contexts and by very different sorts of people who may not have been necessarily aware of what else was happening at the time when they were working. So it's a particular sort of form of, if you like, restaging the, the, um, the, the debate. Now, the essays themselves will be, I think, discussed. Pratama and Hilal are going to be talking about the essays. So I won't spend too much time talking about the essays themselves, but I will say a little bit about the design of the book itself. Uh, next one. Um, what you have here are a set of installations that we put together to accompany Rajni Kothari's Democracy in Search of a Theory. Um, what you have is actually uh, the figure of the, 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 the falling angel of, of, of Ritwik Ghatak in the last uh, sequence of Jukti Thakur Gappo. Um, this, can, can we go back to the beginning? I want to see the first, the cover of the book, right back, first one. Go back. Yeah, uh, you all you already see the figure of the falling ghatak. Now, uh, I have been personally extremely interested in specters, and I, you know, I mean, going back to the FTII, there is this this famous line which said, "Go back, Chauhan, ghatak was here," you know, and the idea of ghatak as a specter, the idea of ghatak as uh, someone who 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 uh, exists in a way. Uh, I mean, you know, there are there are lots of memes of, of ghatak. I mean, including this famous line of. Uh, practice thinking, which is now you find on Calcutta t-shirts, Babo, Babo, Baba, practice Koro, uh, which, is, which is there. And um, so go back to the, the new one. Um, you now have uh, in this set, no, the previous one, this set of uh, imaginations of uh, in on a Sony Sync Master, which is very much a monitor of the 90s, um, the figure of the falling ghatak on incidents that defined millennial India. Um, you have a series of such, I've only showed two of them. Uh, I want to quickly read from, a... one second. Um, we discovered, I mean, this is what I've, what I've written in the preface. We discovered a new, or at least previously undiagnosed ability to read uncanny significances into the familiar, thereby reinvigorating many of our received systems of interpretation and meaning making. Meaning emerged through a fusing of three interpretative modes, says the book basically, argue, the series argues. One from present to past, as you move from the present to, to historical uh, situations. The second from past to future. And a third purely in the present, in the way texts circulated horizontally from hand to hand. As these vectors combined into one hallucinatory amalgam of hindsight and retrofuturism, they revealed a consciousness that we, their readers, viewers, appear to share with makers, often far removed in time and space, a textual solidarity through a process of representation and recirculation, as if pre-designed to address future historical uncertainty, even as the uncertainty generated unexpected creative and analytical opportunity. A ceaseless movement then, the new normal through new light on the constitutive role of normalcy itself. This redefined normal takes us, this book series as a whole argues, back to other moments that had similarly encountered the unprecedented everyday, unprecedented normal. Today's stories, however things pan out, cannot be told without recognizing in them the specters of the 1990s. And the 1990s in turn could not, it further appeared, be comprehended without accessing other equally new moments in history, such as the 1970s and so on. Uh, so that even immediate questions took us back, relentlessly back in times when, uh, you know, things were constantly imagined, reimagined politically and administratively. Um, I move on. This is uh, a 
uh, I mean, I'm just going to selection. This is uh, a set of images accompanying another extremely famous text also, I'm sure, presented in CSDS, Gyan Pandey's uh, uh, In Defense of the Fragment. Uh, Gyan Pandey, uh, as those of you who remember the text will remember, was part of a, part of a PUCL uh, human rights report that actually inquired into the Bhagalpur um, um, communal riots of, of, of 1989. And he actually looks at his experience as a historian at what happened in Bhagalpur in 1989 and wonders how a historian might use that evidence to teach history. Uh, he uses it to actually critique Bipin Chandra's uh, eight standard school textbook called Modern India uh, and, and, and tries to make an argument around, around how uh, this, you know, I mean, the, the findings of this would, would have how this might be actually incorporated into that history. Uh, on the top left hand is, of course, uh, the, the cover of the Bipin Chandra book. Bottom is another installation on of the PUCL report. Uh, and on the right is uh, an, one of the set of images by Javed Iqbal, the photographer, who went back to Bhagalpur 25 years after the incident had happened to take pictures of spaces of... Uh, where, uh, you know, literally of spaces of nothing, where the, the extreme violence had once happened. Um, the, the, this is really what uh, 25 years later Bhagalpur looks like now. Um, keep moving. This is, uh, I mean, I, I should, by the way, mention that along with Ravi and, uh, and Madhav, we have two other authors inside the book who also wrote essays when they were probably much younger. Um, Shuddha's uh, essay from 2000 and... Uh, forgotten uh, the, the Gilani one. And then this is Gita Kapoor's contemporary cultural practice on polemical categories. Accompanying Gita's essay is actually this continued uh, interest in Ritwik Ghatak and the falling figure. This is from the installation by Mohinak Bishwas uh, across the burning track, uh, where you will remember that the, 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 there's, a, there's a kind of a mounting of Jukti Thakur Gapo on a truck as it goes through Newtown. Um, Ghatak then became one of a series of memes that we used in the book. I mean, we used a series of things that constantly kept reappearing. Next one. I want to move to a second meme. Uh, this is actually a painting by K.P. Reji, uh, which goes alongside uh, another very well-known essay by Kancha Ailaya, um, Hindu Death and Our Death. Uh, Ailaya, of course, in Hindu Death and Our Death is basically taking on the kind of idea of a Hindu cosmology, the, the idea of what life, death, and rebirth means in conventional Hinduism, and wants to argue that Dalit um, experiences do not fit into such, a, such, such an idea. Um, Reji's extremely famous work now, I think, is about Dalit, I'm going to read this again, Dalit survival or living on between mythic memory and historical time, between death in life and afterlife. Dalit kids with cutting tools dawdle across a habitat teeming with animal life en route to Gandhi Jayanti festivities at school where they clean premises and overgrown grass. A ship floats by. It is originally the HMS Hermes that had actually seen action during the Falklands War in 1982 and then became the INS Virat when it was purchased by India in 1986. And now in 2012, just be before Riji begins in painting, it is lying in Kochi for its final patch up. Against such historical time is framed an undead past, Bhutam, green trees, bracket leafless branches, teeming with crows, betokening spirits of martyred ancestor heroes. Past noisy ducks is the legendary figure of the Chatan, the spirit of Thumbigal. Uh, by one story, a Dalit peasant believed to have been lynched for falling in love with an upper caste woman, but who's actually transformed as a corpse into, uh, you know, into a breached bund, you know, where he is sacrificing himself to save his community. The spirit of Thumbigal confronts us in a specific mode with open eyes that lock with the viewer's gaze and in the reclining pose reminiscent of the Buddha before attaining Nirvana, the brutalized Dalit corpse on the bottom, you will see it. Uh, an evil, troublesome spirit, Chatan, doubles up as a wise and divine guide to his community today. Uh, the Dalit figure now becomes a meme in this particular book. Keep moving. The idea of time. Uh, so on the, on the left-hand side, we have the section of disappearances, um, escapement, the Rux Media Collective work uh, is on top. And 
on the bottom you will see uh, something called data mugshot which is kg karthik's installation uh, uh, as the viewer's data profile is created through live interaction with a sensor and an algorithm crawls over the internet and feeds into the stream of tweet message with uid ai aadhar biometric and so on that's the line there and of course behind it is the dalit figure um it's the 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 light the prone figure at the bottom um on the center uh, accompanying madhav prasad's uh, essay which madhav hopefully will talk about the republic of babel is uh, the uh, work by riyas komu on citizenship the page on citizenship and inside that also you will notice the embedded figure of the of the dalit uh, prone is 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 inserted and on the right hand side is um a short story by uh, the the kannada writer jayant kaikini the story is set in 1992 93 during the riots and what's happened is that it's actually a story about a photoshop an owner of a photography studio who has photographs of two old people you might say generic ancestors you don't know who they are and this is this is this is what the story is effectively about uh, the image is atul dodia but you will also notice once again uh, the the tumbikal chatan um embedded in there just just below it's a little bit blurred but you'll see it um it took us a lot of lot of just uh, getting all the, uh, the authors to agree to us intervening in their work it took a lot of work to get get uh, atul dodia the rakhs media collective kp reji riyas komu and uh, and uh, karthik to agree to this kind of what i what i increasingly talk about is a mashup uh, a kind of a mashup between text and image that that the series is attempting keep going um shuddha's uh, famous essay at that time on the highly mediatized legal evidence that followed the 13 december 2001 attack on parliament in which armed terrorists entered the parliament house in a car with official stickers got out and began shooting um he has shown here how diverse fantasies of mediatized technology played a central role in the reconstruction of the event itself you know where it was possible to have a huge amount of technology extremely i mean being the courts being very impressed with the use of technology even though the technology itself was not legally um legally uh, whatever uh, you know it, it could not be um, made legally visible uh, the other day we had tisa sethelwar with us and tisa was speaking about this arsenal computing uh, issue when you know there's been this whole hacking that's taken place of some of the people who are currently currently in jail and the role of popular culture in this so on the left hand side we have a mashup again of images from uh, uh, from sanjay kak's uh, jashne azadi and on the right uh, we have a film called 16th december a low brow fictional reenactment of the 13 december attack which actually gives you an idea of the kind of technological popular and the idea of uh, you know uh, the the digital universe that we were entering which the police and the legal apparatus was taking increasingly seriously um move on my third meme uh if my first meme was ghatak my second meme was the kp reji dalit my third meme is kp krishna kumar's thief um this is uh, an image that uh, was was actually put together by gauri nagpal who is uh, the designer of the book and i think the idea was to use krishna kumar's style of drawing in fact i think geeta was momentarily surprised to think that maybe we had unearthed an unknown krishna kumar drawing that was there um and uh, um anita dubey uh, whose questions and dialogue uh, has been reproduced inside this book says of krishna kumar heroic speech in such times can be leavened as conscious strategy by the unheroic dubey herself has spoken of krishna kumar founder and leader of the radical painters and sculptors collective and his fascination with the radicalism of figures who are not glorious and there's been some interest i think in the series we we had the second volume we had some discussion on chandralekha and what happens when you can't dance like chandralekha anymore or what's the difficulty with that and then when we met in uh, media books we had another similar discussion on safdar hashmi and here you have uh, says anita dubey krishna kumar's kind of if you like a rejection of a certain tradition of the left heroic in favor of a very different kind of protagonist that i quote her is edgy naked sexual cunning proletarian uh move on to my last slide i think uh, i think uh, i'm getting a you know whatsapp messages from people saying the slides are not moving that so just stop and reshare i would say you know this happens with Yeah, I just got the last slide. Oh, okay, okay. People in the US. 
Right. Did I continue yeah. speaking? Yeah, I think you can go. Okay. Um, this is an image uh, that accompanies Veena Das's uh, uh, very, very well-known essay on Bhopal, on the Bhopal gas tragedy, on 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 suffering. Um, what you have at the back are is a photograph of Ju by Julian Naika of the uh, Bhopal gas plant um, shortly after the disaster happened. And in front is, of course, the, the Krishna Kumar figure. I'll conclude with uh, a short quotation from Veena Das, which will make the point I wanted to make, I think, in this series, really. In 1985, says Veena Das, a year after the deadly... Sorry, this is not her. This is me writing. In 1985, a year after the deadly industrial disaster occurred at the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, the government of India declared itself as parents petrie, uh, the term is I'm sure well known by now, or parent of the nation to become the unilaterally authorized single representative of all those affected by that disaster. It did so, says Veena Das in her essay, in the name of the people, the, the Renmin, in a way. You know, I think the people is something that we do have a set of connections with here. The people here were declared incapable of speaking for themselves and were thus judicially incompetent or non sui juris. They were not competent to represent themselves. When the victims contested such a labeling in the Supreme Court and claimed the right to represent themselves, says Veena, that's a narrative device came into play, which is a bit like the narrative contract. A narrative device came into play to explain just why the victims were never consulted and how their protests over the settlement decided in their absence could be recast as the actions of irresponsible and ignorant people. Such a device also served to justify the fact that the judges had not allowed public scrutiny of what the government or the medical establishment had done by way of relief and help. This narrative operation which has become increasingly familiar as the millennium has worn on, and I think it's something we must discuss, was in brief this. The people's suffering became on its own sufficient reason to justify the settlement and uphold the usurpation of power by the government. The problem was not with the people when seen as a whole. The problem was not in relation to suffering when seen as a whole. You know, when you're looking at suffering of the people in the abstract, the state is entirely for the suffering people as a whole. It's when you convert those people into actual individuals that the problem really arises. The problem is when you are no longer talking about society in general, when the concept of society is translated into a particular set of victims, every reference, says Veena Das, to victims and their sufferings only served to reify the abstract concept of suffering while dissolving the real victims in order that they could be reconstituted into nothing more than verbal objects. Uh, in a way, this particular kind of verbal object that, that, that you know, has now been, the people have now been converted into one suggests is actually the kind of figure that Krishna Kumar is speaking of, this sort of uh, unheroic proletarian figure or an alternative sort of definition of, of, of heroism. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick little idea of the kind of visual uh, strategies that go alongside the essays that, 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 that are present in order to make sense of them. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks. We can stop share. Uh, yeah. We can zoom into Pratma. So Pratma Banerjee is my colleague. Uh, she is the also the author of a remarkable book with a Durkheimian Dirk title twist, Elementary Aspects of the Political. Uh, all of you should read it. And now Pratma is going to respond. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, panel because Hunger for the Republic is really a an amazingly unusual book. Um, so this is not a standard book of contemporary history that seeks to faithfully reconstruct the 1990s for 2020s readers. Nor is it strictly speaking a genealogy of the present, which seeks to unpack the present to show up its diverse inheritances. And nor, as Ashish made it clear, is the book a collection of latter-day retrospective essays by those who had lived through the 1990s. Hunger for the Republic is a volume designed 
to provoke, even incite, retrospection in its readers. It is, as must be obvious from Ashish's presentation already, it's really a clever work of design with essays, editorial comments, marginalia, news clips, art, photographs, film stills, snippets from FIR reports, stories, anecdotes, etc., brought together in a simulation of a multimedia installation. Two metaphors that appear in the book repeatedly give us a sense of the affect that the book seeks to instigate in us. One, the theological metaphor famously mobilized by the painter Paul Klee and then the philosopher Walter Benjamin, the Angelus Novus, the angel of history, who hurtles backwards into the future while the ruination of the past keeps piling up before him. Two, the equally famous genetic come cybernetic metaphor of our times, the meme, that indexical or informational unit which circulates and mutates without pause, giving an idiomatic, if idiosyncratic, coherence to the being together of widely diverse publics at a certain moment of time experienced as a shared locus of being. Now in India, the 1990s, unlike some, of, uh, some other decades, appears as relatively more clearly defined as a historical period. Bracketed on the one hand, as we know, by the collapse of communism, Mandal Commission, Babri Masjid demolition, economic liberalization, etc., And on the other, by the 2001 attack on the parliament, which gave the Indian nation state a clear post-Cold War global orientation in its fight against terror, or maybe at a stretch, the 2008 economic recession, which marked the end of the world's globalization upswing. The only other example of a coherently grasped decade in India has been the 1940s, which as we know has had several books dedicated to it. But unlike the books which describe the 1940s in terms of landmark historical events and popular movements, hunger for the Republic complicates our understanding of the 1990s decade by bringing together essays published in various years from as early as 1975 to as late as 2017. Some of which work as unintended prospectives or projections, others as self-conscious retrospections. Clearly, in rethinking the 1990s, the book invites us to engage with the complex ways in which we experience, inhabit, and think time. By way of opening oneself to the force of texts, images, and impressions from the past, the book approaches the 1990s thus, and I repeat what Ashish said just now, simply because it is really the crux of the book. The 1990s come through via three movements in time, from the present to the past, from the past to the future, and conjuncturally, that is, in the way that impressions circulate horizontally within the duration experienced as our times. These three movements produce, as Ashish puts it beautifully, a hallucinatory amalgam. And I would like you to 
tell us more about the place of the term hallucination here. A hallucinatory amalgam of hindsight and retrofuturism. So the big book brings together essays on politics, Rajni Kothari, the Andhra Civil Liberties Committee, the Constitution, Tista Setalvad, Society, Sudipto Kaviraj, Religion, Gyan Pandey, Memory, MSS Pandian, Language, Madhav Prasad, Economy, Hamza Alavi, Utsa Patnaik, K. Balagopal, Art, Gita Kapoor, Anita Dube, Photography slash Religion, Jant Kaikini, Cinema, Shuddhabroto, The Internet, Ravi Sundaram, Cast, Sharmila Rege, Kancha Laya, Sexuality, Sunil Mohan and Rumi Harish, Catastrophe, Veena Das, and Law, Death, Suffering, Violence, Activism, Heroism, Everydayness, and Some Pleasure. Themes which cut across the essays, each of which, as you can see, is interrupted by defining visuals and signs of the time, forcing the reader back from the moment of the essay's enunciation into a kind of perspectival orientation on time. Holding the essays together, according to the editor, is the narrative transformation of a people from colonial subject to national citizen, to demographic identity, to ultimately the needy beneficiary of liberal governance. A narrative that both congeals and gives away its reificatory, even violent dynamics in the 1990s. To me, however, there seems to be another theoretical some aesthetic arc that holds the essays together, which has to do with the inadequacy of the concept of modernity to our times. This comes through differently in the different essays collected here. Some of the essays work self-consciously with the idea of contemporaneity, a concept unlike modernity, which tries to grasp diverse pasts and diverse futures as co-evil and competing tendencies in the present. Gita Kapoor explicitly does so by cutting through the shadow play of tradition and modernity in the arts in the 1990s. And Anita Dube does something similar by deconstructing the dichotomy between the two kinds of untimeliness displayed by the folk and the avant-garde. Many of the essays discuss the impossibility of rendering the everyday and catastrophic injustices of our times into a single legible narrative form. Massacres of Muslims and Dalits environmental disasters like the Bhopal gas tragedy, the arbitrary incarceration of individuals picked up under anti-sedition and anti-terrorist laws, and so on. Gyan Pandey and the Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee show how the narrative of history and of fact-finding reportage break down before the spiraling events of Hindu-Muslim riots and Dalit massacre. Shuddhabrata and Veena demonstrate the breakdown of the precedent and case history driven narrative of law. Utsa Patnaik and Hamza Alavi, a surprising but very interesting inclusion, I have to say, with his famous thesis of the disarticulation of the modern and the non modern in colonial economies demonstrate the breakdown of economic narratives of growth, modernization, and development. And Kanchalaya, Sunil Mohan, and Rumi Harish show how even the autobiographical narrative of birth, life, and death become impossible for Dalits and other genders 
an argument which the editor supplements poignantly with references to the Dalit novelist C. Ayappan's stories of haunting of the living by the dead with unfinished and unresolved lives. This denial of narrative time with its attendant logic of anticipation, continuity, resolution, and closure is perhaps one of the most secret, but the most hurtful ways in which people are denied the right to make time their own. To me then, this book on the 1990s is also a book of time. And let me then end with a set of stray questions. The first is an obvious one. Namely, why is there no essay in this book on ecology and environment, given that the 1980s and 90s were famously the years of anti-dam agitations, forest right movements, urban migration, and increasing concerns about urban air pollution. The second question, however, is about a relatively undiscussed topic in the academy. And, but Hilal will probably come on, come on to that uh, in his presentation, which has to do with Indian demographics and its interface with both economics and representational politics at the turn of the century. As we know, the first decade of the 21st century saw several governmental attempts to redefine India's social demographics, presumably in response to the dominance of religious identity politics of the 1990s. Gujarat happens in 2002, the Sachar Committee submits its report on the economic profile of India's Muslims in 2006, and Arjun Sengupta, who is already writing profusely from the 2000, from the year 2000, submits his report on no longer the working classes, but what comes to be called informal labor in 2008 and 9. Soon, we shall also see the return of demands for caste census in India, just as the rise of cephalogy, 1990s onwards, starts to work at making visible women as a demographic constituency that votes as a whole in India's democracy. In any case, Population has been an abiding question at the heart of the Indian Republic from early modernization decades, especially under the influence of American developmental economics. Population was also that which defined the emergency and subsequently came to be repackaged in post-liberalization times as the world's biggest supply of cheap labor and the world's largest consumer market. It seems to me that the politics of demographics is something that hides in plain sight and something that has been the Republic's political unconscious, which the academy has really not engaged head on. The third question is something that I've already asked over tea to Ashish. The there is far too little religion in this collection than there was in our experience of the 1990s, which was literally marked by enormous amount of religious speak or religion speak, both in the public domain and in the academy, including perhaps the, the final rise and fall of the Indian secularism debate. So I was wondering, was, was it a strategic uh, decision to kind of keep out some of those writings that came up uh, in 1992, 93, 94? And finally, a third question, uh, a fourth question on the transformation of popular media in these years, uh, aside of the technology question, which we have already discussed here, 
I'm thinking of the rise of video parlors and video culture in the 1980s, much of which I have learned from my colleagues at Sarai here, but also the coming of cable TV uh, in the late 1990s, which transformed popular consumption of both news, but also domestic drama. For me, I cannot imagine the 1990s without us graduating as a nation to Saspika Bibahuti and to mythologicals, both in Hindi and in various regional iterations of the very same. So I'll just rest my case here and really enjoyed and was, um, I've never seen a book like this, designed like this. So thank you very much for that. This one quick little thing that one, uh, this is volume three, which I'm going to give to you later, which has a lot of stuff on video parlors, Sasbi Kavi Bahuti, and so on. So I'm, going, I'm now going to hand over uh, the mic to Madhav. Madhav is a well known film scholar, he's a cultural theorist. Uh, he is, he's also a great singer <laughs> and an old friend. And, uh, so Madhav. All right, thank you. So, yeah, my. Uh, Brief is a little different because I'm a contributor and I'm also going to talk about my own contribution in a way. Uh, in the sense that looking at, uh, looking back at it, you know, using Sudipto's concept of historical horizon, which he uh, maybe now it's okay. Huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the historical horizon, which um, which Sudipto Kaviraj introduces in that essay in this book, uh, which is, you know, in a way, what he's saying is that there are moments when there is a change, and uh, it redefines everything in that. You know, so I think since he has written his, since he wrote his piece, I think some such thing has happened. One more such event. Uh, horizon, you know, uh, changing event has happened. I mean, and uh, so it's in that spirit that you look back at it and uh, see what might be different. But in essentially, it's about an argument that I've been making for some time about uh, the question of language uh, in Indian political life. So, um, as she suggested that I begin with a, a, a small quote from the previous essay to just because there are some questions there which, with which I ended. Uh, I'll just read a few lines from there. Uh, what is the way forward? Are we stuck with a normative model of one nation, one language, which may or may not be just an accidental feature of some states? As the impossible ideal we struggle in vain to achieve, is there some way in which a democratic polity can be conceived without this requirement? Or do we need to redescribe our own political existence in other terms than that of the nation state? Are we then dealing with an older state form or some as yet unrecognized new one? So this is some of the questions. And uh, I don't know that I've, uh, I've sort of taken up all those questions to uh, discuss here, but I've kept that in mind, you know, you know, uh, to look back in the in the process of looking back. So I'll just read it. Um, the burden of the paper, my paper today, was, was the, uh, then was the question of better description of the political order we inhabit, instead of automatically generating a description from the mere fact of existence of a constitution. Uh, so uh, description of the political order in relation to the key terms, three, that is language, nation, state, democracy. This question has also been discussed by several of the writers included in this volume. And of these, I will begin by citing one whose unambiguous thesis like statement may grate on our ears in today's political atmosphere but which I believe we might have rather uh, hastily rejected. 
uh, this is Anita Dube, which uh, you know the essay written in 18, 1987, uh, which is to say in a different historical horizon, to use Kaviraj's phrase, calls for an, uh, quote, uncompromising consciousness of nationhood through which an artist can speak to his people and at the same time stand in the world arena, shoulder to shoulder with the community of universal human and artistic truths. The freedom of man, she continues, can only be realized within the concept of a nation. So it's a, it's a kind of throwback to the internationalist uh, phase, which was replaced by the globalization uh, moment, um, more, uh, more you know, subsequently. The relation between the nation form and the modern political universal proposed here by Dubé is not an eternal truth, but a strictly historical relation. It militates against the assumption of a correlation between the size of a polity and the measure of its universality. That is to say, bigger is more universal and a world state will achieve total universality and all those kinds of uh, you know, assumptions. Modern universals are rather related to the citizen subject in whom inalienable natural rights and historically uh, specific political rights are combined. By alienating some rights to the general will, as the story goes, individuals acquired the protection of the state for their property in person. We can set aside the details of this fiction for the moment and concentrate on what is of the essence, alienation. It is this forcing out, forcing out of organic relations, the splitting of the subject into a pathological self and a universal that inaugurates a steady transformation of the very character of human life the very meanings attached to existence. This splitting of the human subject is the real modern revolution, though it takes time to become effective and is not something achieved all at once. When we assess our own social contract as manifested in the text of the constitution and the different institutions through which it works, we are usually content to measure reality against the ideals enshrined, as they say, in the Constitution, and invariably find great deficiencies, gaps. But this is a fallacious analytical strategy. By assuming that ideals must be implemented, it gives itself a rather simple task of measurement, which can be performed in multiple areas of aspiration. It avoids a more fundamental question. Can such ideals listed in a book be implemented without an ongoing process of alienation going on alongside. In other words, can a society in which only the ruling class is alienated and the rest find the doors to alienation closed for them a viable candidate for parliamentary democracy? I say parliamentary democracy because here it is a question not only a question only of what is historically possible rather than some abstract ideal with no basis in the current state of preparedness. In Marx's early writings, there are a few scattered mentions of a term, mode of cooperation. Though it's not explained and it's less well known than the mode of production, the instances of use, however, do provide some indications as to what it might mean. The idea is that corresponding to every mode of production, there is a mode of cooperation. To concretize further, that for the capitalist mode of production, the corresponding mode of cooperation is parliamentary democracy. Now we know that in democratic, now we know that in democratic societies, fictive contractual relations regulated and policed by institutions of the state place, replace the organic ties of obligation and compulsion which prevailed in the past. This is the primal moment of alienation of which Rousseau is the first poet. But as Catherine Malibu, uh, in an essay, reading Hegel's commentary on Rousseau points out the latter's contract theory operates in an entirely abstract space where the new 
contractual formation simply bring together a random collection of people who agree to the terms of the contract. The signatories have, in other words, no history prior to this moment of alienation. Hegel per Malibu shatters this abstract edifice with a simple question. In what language was the contract written? He thus draws attention to the fact that the contracting individuals are members of a pre-existing community who are already tied to each other with those very bonds of obligation and coercion or compulsion. Their status as a community is already secure and now they will proceed to revise, legalize the terms of their coexistence. In other words, it is a nation that alienates itself to become a nation state. Thus, the mode of cooperation, parliamentary democracy, which corresponds to the capitalist mode of production, can only have a nation as its field of play. This too, it should be emphasized again, is a strictly historical condition. Nations are no more eternal than democracies or capitalism. But in this historical moment, their convergence has yielded a powerful socio-political economic form, which has a compelling force that turns it into a universal aspiration. We cannot get to a different, better future by circumventing it. There's no option but to go through it, not only seemingly, but substantially. I would even put it more strongly. For us now, parliamentary democracy is the horizontal aspiration and any other, other alternative can only be a phantasm. In India, we have dreamt of a state that would build a nation from scratch, thus reversing the first principle of contractual theory. This is because for us, the state was given in advance by dint of colonial subjection. I do not think our leaders at the time even considered the possibility of refusing this impossible task and undertaking instead the work of description and conception of an original design for the unique place that the subcontinent is. This epic task that the governing class set itself is rendered doubly difficult by the fact that the communal substance out of which this nation is to be formed is already shaped into distinct historical communities of which some claim the very status of nation that the whole wants for itself. Like a cat eating its own litter or like the mythical King Yayati, the whole, a civilizational unity at best, wants to thrive, to enjoy at the expense of its own progeny. A lot of breaking, or shall we say demolitions, all involving high levels of violence will have to take place before the substance is reprocessed to fit into the molds of the ideas of, whole, of the whole that are ready to receive them. No doubt of the two competing parties with their idea molds, one is in more of a hurry than the other, making the latter seem to many a better option. The inertia inherited from the colonial regime distracted the class that holds the reins of the whole from fully playing its historical role vis-a-vis -vis the interior, that of an incubator that brings the nationalities to maturity so that there could then be genuine attempts at nation state making under the aegis of a federal overseeing authority. Even if reluctantly, this class performed the task to some extent. But for a long time, the nationalities were deprived of the natural avenues for alienation, which became the exclusive privilege of the English mediated. It's no surprise that the, then that Indian citizenship, like membership of some exclusive clubs, is available only to those who can translate themselves into English, so to speak. The national project lacking legitimacy depends more and more on the power of the imagination and the persuasive force of an idea. However, lacking hegemonic force, this idealism remains an ideology of the ruling class. It's poetry untranslatable into the vernaculars of the nationalities. So far, periodic eruptions of charismatic authority have been the only means of restoring the primacy of the Indian national idea. In the past, the idea was kept pure and the process of its realization was slowed down whenever signs of resistance were encountered. This hesitancy was due as much to the secular progressive ideology of the ruling class as it was to its awareness of a lack of legitimacy. 
the new alternative Indian nationalism, which is Hindu nationalism, has set itself the task of gaining legitimacy, not by slow persuasion, but by a precipitous program of mobilization. Although the governing class played its role in this exclusive allotment of alienation rights, the more important obstacle to breaking this monopoly was the restrictions imposed on capitalist energies in the name of socialism. In the last two or three decades since liberalization of the economy, India appears to be on the way to becoming not only a capitalist economy, but a capitalist society or group of societies. A process of historical clarification is afoot. New sites of conjunction of capitalism, nation and democracy, those are the three terms that uh, you know, I brought, was up saying, but came together in the conjunction are emerging and the clamor for a, a federal reconstruction of the whole, albeit still lacking theoretical clarity, is mounting. But the adversary is stronger and the task is not easy. Thank you. I now hand over the floor to my colleague Hilal Ahmed. And uh, Hilal uh, occupies a particularly interesting, all of you have read Hilal, he's very prolific, he's many books, he writes regularly, but I think today Hilal has taken on a particular task, uh, addressing the question of the political, which forms uh, a key element in the book. And how we... Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, basically, my task is simpler than all of you, because I have to speak to um, a particular essay by Rani Puthai, that's the first essay. But before I talk about that essay, I think it's a beautiful book, beautiful in two senses. One, the sequence of uh, articles uh, makes you feel that you are actually in a dialogue. And that is, you know, that a dialogue is unfolding. And second, visual, it's visually very pleasing. So it gives you an impression that you have to engage with it, uh, not in a conventional sense of the term. You have to have different kind of engagement with the book. And when I read this essay, which is, you know, part of, you have taken it and it's beautifully edited, by the way, you have, you know, take out various part of the book, uh, particularly the introduction, which is, which you have taken from uh, Rethinking Democracy, the book, which came out in 2005. Uh, and, you know, as I said, that there is a very interesting correlation between one essay and the other. Look at the conclusion which Kaviraj offers, and the question Kothari is offering, there is a remarkable consistency in these two. So what I'm going to do is to, and I had a lot of uh, conversation with Kothari in his last days. So these questions which he was actually writing about were there in our conversation. So what I'm going to do is to talk about a few contradictions, which he was aware when he was writing that and that is very clearly brought out in the, in the essay and especially in the book. So I read this essay, not merely in relation to this book, but also in the larger book, which he's, he produced in 2005. This essay by Kothari, in my view, underlines two crucial yet contradictory points. There is an intellectual quest to produce a multifaceted macro and in a way futuristic conceptualization of democracy without deviating from the micro level complexities. Kothari is keen to give adequate attention to the grassroots political processes, yet his wider objective is to envisage democracy as a tool to achieve what he calls human emancipation. This is not an easy task. As an intelligent and creative thinker, Kothari is fully aware of the limitation of grand theoretical projects such as Marxism and liberalism. He is also very uncomfortable with Western mode of thinking about democracy. However, he does not want to give up the possibility of imagining positive futures and even utopias. And you may find that unease in Gyan Pandey's article as well. So that's one kind of contradiction which Kothari is dealing with. The second contradiction is deeply, deeply personal to him. One encounter an interesting tussle between a trained political analyst, we all know Congress system, uh, and a committed political activist. Kothari, the analyst, examines the political processes carefully, 
weaves an engaging illustrative narrative and eventually produces a very neatly worked out explanation of the power structure. This analytically truthful account of democracy makes him sad and uncomfortable. He cannot defend this politically pessimistic picture. Remember that he defended his Congress system in 1974, even during the time when JP movement was about to begin. So he was aware of these things. He was in his public writing, writing something very different. But in an essay in, uh, which came out in a journal, he defended that. But here, he, he produced a remarkably important analysis of the contemporary political processes, yet he's uncomfortable about it. Here we meet another Kothari, the activist. He takes us to the next level of thinking by highlighting the need to have a positive and engaging intellectualism. I do not think that Kothari was able to resolve this contradiction. Even in the book, you don't find any answer to these questions. He does not expect the political class to produce a positive imagination of democracy. Instead, he calls upon the intellectual class, people like us, to get involved in creative theorization. At least this is the conclusion which I draw from this text. To understand Kothari's unease, we may examine the official trajectories of the idea of democracy in post-colonial India. And I think that uh, three important uh, conceptual reference points are useful. One, democracy as a celebration. Two, democracy as an end in itself, and three, democracy as a tool to achieve something. Democracy as a celebration. The official celebration of Indian democracy, especially this year, which is Amrit Kal, seems to revolve around a simple, plain, and straightforward narrative of an ongoing success. The phrase world's largest democracy, which emerged in 90s, is gradually replaced by a new and more powerful expression, the mother of democracy. Indian culture and values are described as ideal precondition for democracy to survive. Narendra Modi also highlighted this fact in his Independence Day speech. He said, and this is the translation which I did, uh, he said, the world was not cognizant that India has an inherent potential of strong cultural values, a bond of thought deeply embedded in mind and soul, and that is India is mother of democracy, unquote. This official interpretation gives us an impression that democracy is an end in itself, an ideal that has to be cherished for its own sake. Although Modi also talks about the responsibility of a democracy to get rid of political evils in his view, dynasty and nepotism as expected. Uh, in his framework, democracy is not envisaged as a kind of political instrument. The portrayal of Indian democracy as an end in itself is a relatively new phenomenon. It is true that the success of electoral politics was always highlighted by the state to underline the distinctiveness of Indian political experiences, yet it was only in the early 90s when the political class began to celebrate India's democracy as an end in itself. It is worth noting that democracy as a form of government was characterized very differently in the early decades after the independence. It was seen as an instrument to realize a few big ideals, socialistic pattern of society, socialism, nation building, and so on, and even uh, Dharam Rajya. The ongoing celebration of Indian democracy this year gives us a perfect opportunity to revisit some of the questions which Kothari asked in this book. Now, democracy as an instrument. The term democracy is officially used to describe at least four features of Indian political system. I'm talking about the official meaning of democracy and these four features are supremacy of written constitution, and if you are interested, read the recent EWS judgment in which this point was categorically highlighted. That is the difference between populism and the constitutional form of democracy. In fact, there was a consensus in, in the judgment that basic structure doctrine must be emphasized and the, uh, the idea that we have a written constitution must categorically be the defining feature of our political system. Second, Institutional setup based on the principle of separation of power, fair and regular elections as operative mechanism, and finally, a commitment to have a welfareism as a policy. 
And this is also reflected in various judgments of Supreme Court in recent years. There is a remarkable consistency in adhering to these features in the official discourse of the state, especially in the domain of public policy. However, their meanings and interpretations are always determined contextually. We must remember that the Indian nationalism was not merely anti-colonial in nature. There was also an enthusiasm to produce new, constructive, and in a way, futuristic imagination of an ideal Indian society in the state, the ideas of India, and especially in 40s. Democracy, as expected, was seen as an instrument to achieve these imaginations. The constant assembly was clearly a site where these futuristic results were discussed and debated to produce a workable institutional apparatus. Nehru, who had always been interested in offering explanatory templates to his political action, gave a persuasive thesis, the socialistic pattern of society. society. For Nehru, socialistic pattern of society was an India-specific resolve to have a very specific kind of welfare state. In his 1954 speech, Nehru clarified that the welfare state in India should not ignore the importance of wealth generation. Democracy in this schema was seen as a tool for achieving greater degree of political participation as well as the distribution of wealth. It is true that Nehru's ideas became the basis for the official discourse on planning. It does not, however, mean that the successive Congress regimes continue to follow the socialistic pattern of society thesis as the ultimate official goal. The emergency regime of Indira Gandhi is very relevant in this regard. Indira Gandhi justified the emergency for achieving a few crucial objectives like rational security, economic development, and the upliftment of the poor and marginalized groups. Interestingly, she did not deviate from the established official imagination of democracy. She envisaged democracy as a reliable instrument for effective political action, despite the fact that individual liberties and fundamental rights of citizens were clearly violated during the time of emergency. The opponent of Indira Gandhi, interestingly, and especially people like JP, offered an equally fascinating imagination of this idea of democracy. JP, who wrote a powerful critique of Indian political system in 1959 in his book, A Plea to Reconstruct Indian Polity, also recognized democracy as a method to have what he calls total revolution. Democracy as an instrument for social change thesis started declining in 80s. This process began during the time of Rajiv Gandhi regime. The subsequent coalition government led by VP Singh and Chandrasekhar did not show any interest in propagating any big ideals. By the time the secular communal binary began to offer new language of professional politics. Now democracy, and this is the, the third meaning, third metaphor which I would like to use, democracy as an end in itself. The 1990s, and which is the topic of the, today's discussion, what a watershed moment in my view. In order to expedite the process of economic liberalization and globalization, the state began to redefine its political role. Any direct intervention by the government in the sphere of economy was seen as a structural constraint. The assumption that unrestricted market would eventually facilitate growth and development was strongly propagated by the government as an uncontested economic truth. And there was a political consensus on that as well. This new market-friendly political consensus, however, posed a serious challenge for the political class. The role of the state as a mediator between open market and citizen was to be legitimized, while on the other hand, there was a need to redefine the idea of welfareism. These challenges actually paved the way for a new official imagination of democracy. Now, Kothari also touched upon this question in his book, not in the, in the introduction, but in the book. But he did not actually historicize this idea sufficiently in his overall theorization. The political class started worshiping the constitution as a distinct and self-explanatory text. And it was Mr. Modi who started saying it's a sacred document. Even the Hindutva forces, which had always been uncomfortable with certain provision of the constitution, began to treat it as a holy book. The parliament and judiciary were recognized as symbol of institutional durability. 
while the overwhelming and ever increasing participation of people in election was shown as evidence of the success of indian political system finally and most importantly a sectoral welfareism addressing social groups such as women adivasi dalit muslim and obc as distinct stakeholders was adopted to refashion a new discourse of social inclusion in other words a successful attempt was made to establish the fact that democracy is actually nothing but an identity and in itself the contemporary moment of indian democracy underlined an interesting conflict between these two official imaginations the political party envisage themselves as professional entities like firms they treat citizen as political consumers in the open market space of elections this established framework of politics goes well with the democracy as an and itself thesis however the ever increasing economic and social disparity poses a different challenge the aspiration of marginalized communities cannot be satisfied entirely by offering a few attractive packages or aggressive political marketing this lead to an elusive search for a new political ideas and imagination unfortunately the political class in india has failed to produce such ideas the new and futuristic ideals ideas of india and this is in my view exactly the reason why kothari that book in 2005 thank you very much you uh, there there's so many uh, things on the table and ashish do you want to uh, come back, come in now i am going to ask uh, geeta also to say a few words uh, geeta if you want <laughs> and uh, because i had at some uh, at some points and i also wanted shruta uh, you know uh, because you have an essay it's really on the political trial and what is interesting i think in both your uh, essay geeta is this introduction of the idea of the contemporary and and opening and connecting connecting it to larger intellectual debates in the way you're framing it and and shruta in so far as your essay is concerned i'm very curious because it this refashioning of the political trial to technologized evidence is a big shift from first the old ina trials the, the classic pre colonial political trials uh to a new shift to the forensic which starts from post 2000s uh, maybe the first part you know what does it tell us in terms of where we think about this the hunger of the republic i mean these are the kind of intimations that we are seeing it may it is of the 90s but it is not of the 90s it is seems almost 2021 and 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 in geeta if you want to come in now i mean if you want to re revisit that essay vis a vis i mean we don't want to go back to the past to the inst instrumental lens of the present you know smashing the to the inst instrumental lens of the present we don't want to go back to the past i mean in in so far as revisiting that essay i wanted both of you because both we have two writers in the room to sort of come in and uh, yes yes should, yes of course should. but questions are open uh, you know ashish can say more words it's it's a you know we're having it, it, it's a relaxed team. yeah you know questions are open for the full floor uh about the text so the selection of the text of the uh, the the aesthetic design yes of course he'll respond no i mean fortunately uh, since i haven't written the book i am not answerable for it uh you know uh, and even if i had written the book i would have probably said are you asking me or ask, asking the book because the book may have its own own explanation and i might have mine uh so i i uh, um just quickly um um Pratima's this question of demographics. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's rather obvious to say that there's no the book does not attempt to be exhaustive or you know anything. It takes a particular kind of problem, and I think one one set of problems, and I think it tries to force uh, many of these different authors, some of whom I knew. By the way, uh, Hilal, I want to tell you one little story, which is that my only encounter with Rajni Kothari was. Yeah, it was actually very funny. What happened was that CM Naim was sitting there outside, and Shahid Amin was outside, and there was a whole bunch of their friends who were there, and they were talking really loudly. And suddenly, this really irritable old man just kind of slams the door open and he says, "How is one supposed to think here? You know, just shut up, just keep quiet, go away." And then he kind of slammed the door and went inside. That's my only time I encountered Kothari. So, like Ritwik Ghatak, Kothari is somebody whom I really came to know about after. 
you know, uh, after he was no more almost. I mean, um, and it was, it's, for me, I actually see these figures more or less as, as figures of history. And I am trying to get them to throw light on a problem that I'm worrying about, yeah? So, so there is a fairly significant amount of editorial intervention where I'm trying to get them to say things that are, I mean, one doesn't change the text uh, beyond the point. Uh, there is some editorializing that's going on, but there is a certain kind of selection that, that sort of teases out a particular kind of problem. Now, in doing this, uh, I'll, I'll come to the demographic thing in just a minute, but I'm, I'm just trying to make a problem point here. In doing this, what happens is that when authors start saying things that you didn't think they had said, or, you know, I mean, I, I, it was yesterday that I actually sent the last passage of Madhav's you know, which he quoted there and said, Madhav, can you speak about this? And he said, did I say that? Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure many of you would probably say, I wasn't the person who wrote that uh, essay at that point of time. I think that there is a, there's an issue of textuality here. And I think this is to do with, I think going back to Ravi's point, a certain hiatus that has taken place in our time. Now, in that situation, what can happen potentially is that Kothari may have worried about a particular problem but he may actually be seen in hindsight to be saying something quite different. So, for example, I mean, there would be, you know, you mentioned these three registers of democracy, um, the, uh, the celebration, the end in itself, and the tool. Now, it is entirely possible that the tool can, in hindsight, become a celebration, you know, or uh, the uh, end in itself may, in hindsight, become a tool. You know, so that particular structure of mobil mobilization is, I think, very, very significant. And central to it actually is a demographic question in the sense in which, and here I think the Veena Das point is very important, that the abstraction of the people, so that when the state speaks in the name of the people, the state is producing an entire discourse that is of democracy because this, nobody is more concerned about the people than the state in the abstract, you know? And then you have the further narrative iteration of that conversion of the abstract into actual policies where actual people are then incarcerated or whatever, you know? So you then have a situation where actual people can be put in jail in their own interest. You know, when you have a situation where people can be denied certain things because the state thinks that it knows better than them. That's the kind of shift that one is talking about in, 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 in a way. Now, um, my own feeling is that I think a lot of authors, some of them may not be interested. Uh, I think some of them aren't interested. Uh, but, but others may actually, you know, want to actually speak about the gap that may have separated may separate what they're currently thinking with, from what was happening at that. I know this happened certainly with the Panopticon essay. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, there's something at that time one thought of it as extremely prescient because those were the glory days of the internet. That was a time when suddenly you actually were able to access the world and, 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 and the planetary archives in a certain way, you know, and to have a situation where you are talking about problems that only now arise, I mean, when you're getting a sense of what the digital ecosystem of governance is looking like, you know, that, I mean, so it's it's in that particular context that I think that that, that particular shift is taking place, right? So now what's happening is that the intervention of technology, which itself is without content, becomes then a possible space for the, uh, the uh, like a sponge or something, it, for, for the uh, inheritance of ideas from an earlier time, which are then internalized and refracted, you know? So you then have a situation where, I mean, this has been an argument that I've been very interested in of how if the 20th century was primarily about representation, Darstellung, you know, the, the entire thing about, about representational structures, the 21st, our century is about simulation, you know? So if you, you're simulating democratic mechanisms, you know, you actually have a situation where you apparently are adhering to a lot of these questions, uh, but, you're, but you're doing them in, in a way that, that, that operates on them rather, rather differently. And this brings me to the, the other thing about the, about the language question, because I think that one very crucial about this was the way Madhav put it, that language as a condition of citizenship, as a, as, as a, you know, in, in relation, was at once the glue that held the nation together and the problem for the nation. You know, in a, way, in a way, it was something that existed without which a nation could not exist, uh, certainly a place like India. But at the same time, it was put in a rather different way. It was a crisis that was unresolvable. 
you know so 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 you then had a kind of a situation of a of a practical pragmatic condition that in which certain things existed in you or you know I once you sort of saying in in i think it was in japan when we were there together they said that if we didn't have english you would have had to have the the un peacekeeping force you know uh, some, some you know some such some such structure you know so the language does play a certain kind of role in relation to that and i think mother was actually pushing that point to a situation as you ended here with what would happen if the kind of state structures that this needed were were rendered either impossible or inconceivable i mean you know or or may have historically been been inconceivable as presented by this particular problem so we are looking at then two things one is we are looking at a methodology but you're also looking at a textual way of reading certain things uh, against the grain which i think is a very important thing to do you know so uh, that those those were the sort of thoughts that i had as you well know. the floor is now open yes of course please yeah, yeah. <clears throat> thank you thank you for uh, for the deliberation i got the book i have not i have not read it but few uh, uh, questions or comment on 1990s i think a language of analysis must be analyzed of 1990s and we see the how new liberalization or new liberalism was making road into the discourse of politics itself for example we had a various new terms introduced in the study of politics like civil society governance or 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 regulatory authorities we call extra constitutional authorities these are the important features of 1990s or the concept like social capital they must invite uh, attention in 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 the discourse of the politics of 1990s and also this is the period when second feature i think apart from uh, what we discuss is drifting of india away from internationalism i mean this is the very important period when we were drifting away from bandung belgrade and havana tri continental spirit of internationalism and finally finally abandoning the position of nehru by congress party not by the contemporaryism because of the third is we also see the shift in 1990s arrival of shift from politics of remorse to politics of mobilization and we need to focus that how politics of remorse has uh, has has been replaced by the politics of mobilization in 1990s and fourth i think uh, politics of hope is also important part of this decade and i think uh, in terms of methodology in terms of promethean aspects and the values for example we need more closer analysis of women's movement new social movements and mandal politics the way the democratization was also kind of democratization was uh, becoming possible and then we had a counter demo counter mobilization by other forces thank you so much um thank you ashish it's a remarkable set of books and i'm particularly enjoying the the way in which um the design element actually acts as a, as another text within the book and books um i think that one of the key questions and since i've been asked to comment on my own uh, contribution first i'd like to say that it was a form of writing that also evolved here in the 90s Uh, and in the 90s in the early 2000s so the text that i wrote is very much a part of a certain kind of discursive culture that grew in the early 2000s so this was social media before social media it was in the internet as a space of political and social commentary before the rise of uh, portals and blogs and i think it there is a moment of archaeology and you know, a genealogy of those things so that's one thing but the other thing is that i think that what i reread my essay today and i'd forgotten a lot of it so it was a nice moment to remember it and it it had this very uncanny feeling of how that essay which i had no idea of uh, presages some of the realities that we are contending with and it ties into some of the questions that actually prathama and hilal have both raised the changing nature of the contract and madhav has also talked about it between let's say citizens and between citizens and the state and between who is a citizen and who is some other shadowy figure 
So the my essay very briefly talks about how do we learn to recognize who is a terrorist? I mean, I start with the remarkable statement that L.K. Advani said when he said that the people who attacked the parliament looked like Pakistanis. I mean, given the fact that he also looks like Pakistani because that's where he's from, it's interesting for me, it was very curious for me to think about what this idea of looks like the Pakistani, looks like what became a phrase, the Wire actually did a fantastic article plotting the use of the term anti-national from about 2016 onwards and how it enters our discourse in Twitter feeds and so on, who uses it most of the time. But how could we begin to recognize, in which we began to recognize in, from around 2001, 2002, what an anti-national is and what he or she looked like, which for me is a counterpart to the unstated premise of that term, if there is somebody called an anti-national, there must be somebody called a national, a bona fide citizen. And if we are looking at changes in citizenship law from the original 1955 Citizenship Act, which is actually quite a remarkable and open citizenship law, to the First Amendment to it that comes in 1986, which restricts um, citizenship to restricts the just solely principle so that it's not enough to be born in India. You have to prove that one of your parents is a legal Indian citizen, was an Indian citizen, and the other is not an illegal migrant. And this is a very important moment because it's an attempt by the then Rajiv, I think, uh, Rajiv Gandhi government to try and square the problem of the Assam Accord, which, which is like a time bomb in the Indian political system, which is still detonating. You have 86, then you have, there's another Citizenship Amendment Act in 2012, which then again limits further the question of who can be an Indian citizen. And I think it's along with this, this restriction of the idea of citizenship and the contract between citizens and the citizen and the state, there is also beginning to emerge a figure that in 2001, 2002, we begin to recognize as the citizens binary other, the anti-national. And the parliament attack case, and it's near, there's another, and the thing is that the Sarai reader list became the stage in which all manner of, from the absolutely bizarre to the absolutely sensible speculations on this case, as well as a case previous to it, the red fort attack. You wrote it in the basement, should yes. This one, this, this, this <laughs> and, and was dismissed as a crank by many. <laughs> but I think that what happened in those situations is that we began to, and there's this, this plethora of films that begins with the one that 16th December that you refer to. There are separate, there's one the fantastic film called Khaki and others where we begin to recognize this person. Today, we're in a situation where that pedagogic process is completed. Nobody needs to be told how to recognize a citizen, a uh, terrorist. We know. I was tracking Delhi police advertisements that said, how do you recognize a citizen? They wear clothes unsuitable to the weather, which includes you right now, Ashish. Uh, yes. Delhi winter, you're hardly, you know, another, yeah. <clears throat> right. Or, so they stand out because they wear clothes unsuitable to the weather, or they blend in. So both standing out and blending in are signs of being this subversive figure. And we write a lot about this in this book. But to now where we know, nobody needs to educate you on who the terrorist is. So since I've been following trials, as you said, this was my first attempt to deal with an anti-terrorism trial. Since then, this has been my obsession. It's my rabbit hole to the anti-terrorism trials that are ongoing today, where is it? And I will close with this. Where, let's remember again that these trials are in relationship to a movement to reclaim citizenship as an idea, which is what the Shaheen Bagh protests were. I mean, since it's quite remarkable in any given society at the current moment that the preamble to the constitution becomes a 
popular text that has to be recited and that those leading those recitations then become arrested as the anti-national. And there's a peculiar irony to that, where the statement with, so earlier in the 2001 parliament attack case, there was an attempt to create a body of evidence out of thin air. Today, the argument is actually remarkably different which is that if you look at the anti-terrorism trials of the Delhi riot so-called protagonists, the prosecution arguments is that the absence of evidence is the evidence. They don't have to create evidence. So if let's say Omar Khalid says, we want peace and non-violence, then the prosecution said that is the evidence. Where he says peace, he means war. And there's a, there's a statement and I've written long, essays now about this. So there's a statement that haunts me till this day, which is the final prosecution's arguments in the closing of the bail applications, not even trial yet, where the prosecutor says, it's a fantastic statement. Housewives do housewifely things and citizens return in the evening from office. So therefore the citizen is the gentleman of the house and sits on the sofa and switches on television. How do these people, this housewife and the citizen, end up at popular protests? Because this is so uncharacteristic of what housewives and citizens do. This must be because intellectuals, artists, and poets are seducing them into an idea that they have to become political subjects, whereas they actually have no interest. So the citizen is being made into the anti-national now by the seduction produced by actually people who are non-entities, people like me or Rahul Roy or all the people who are all implicated in this grand terrorist conspiracy, we have no influence. But the state decides, or the prosecution, let's say, the prosecutorial arm of the state decides that the realm of the production of the anti-citizen in the heart of the citizen must be a question of culture. This is a shift from 1990s where culture taught us to recognize who the anti-national was to now, where culture produces the double within. So I think that the 1990s as a, as a kind of stage setting for the place that we are in today. And this transition, this idea of the citizen and the, and the anti-citizen or the non-citizen or the shadow citizen is something that I feel political theory and political science in India hasn't actually started thinking about. We're still, obsessed with numbers, not with their shadows. Thanks. Uh, anyone else uh, want to come in? I was just thinking about, uh, you know, something that uh, came up, you know, it's, it's actually detailed in Madhav's essay, and it's something you brought up, Shruta, is this classic recognition debate. You know, as we all know, Charles Taylor argues that misrecognition is a form of moral harm, and recognition, this, this whole dramaturgy of liberal, the liberal recognition. You you gain it through through intersubjective relations. Uh, it you 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 do it through merit, right? Now something clearly muddles in the nineties. Something 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 muddles in this kind of long story of Indian democracy. Now I'm wondering if we should reclaim recognition. That is again going back on the liberal path, or do we? I am not persuaded by it as a category uh, yet. I feel there are different forms of valuation that have come in. Uh, you know, money, media. So how do we, how do we, we are living in a completely different environment now. The, the economy has boomed. A lot of people are part of the financial circuits. There's a political philosophy that offers you entry into this world. So, uh, and, and to recognize yourself as a major, you know, as, as a country, a democracy of the majority. So how do we uh, refashion this term? How do we revisit this term? And this is something that, that, you know, when I read this book, I, I was trying to think about is recognition still a concept that we reclaim? Or do we go back to the misrecognition, you know, the old question again? So Very briefly, can I say something? Yeah. I think that what was emergent from the Shahinbag situation was this one sentence, hum kagas nahi dikhayenge. It was actually a refusal to be recognized and verified, right? So it was saying that life should be the criterion by which we demonstrate our the deservingness that we have of being in society, that the modus of verification and 
recognition through the verificatory me mechanism is something we should not recognize. I mean, I think that there's both a refusal and perhaps an inability to, to reclaim recognition. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the specific point is, I think it's continuing on this thing about the citizen and the anti-citizen. I think that the, the, the dialectic between citizen and anti-citizen is really mediated through the prism of the people, which is a third in the, in the triad. And I think that the appropriate, the, the, the abstraction of the people and the fact that the state can, uh, this, this parents, parents petrie concept, I think is really something we must take seriously. In fact, uh, even, even in the arts one was saying the other day, I think that, you know, I mean, we know the symbolic definitions of the state, but the idea of the parents petrie is not something that I think we've, We've thought about enough in terms of what kind of a symbolic response there might be might be to that. Now, in that context, for example, if you look at let us say um, the privacy bill, the draft privacy bill, or the Sri Krishna thing, the, they actually have an entire uh, structure, almost a handbook on how to reclaim recognition. You know, it, it's it's like saying you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to have let us say a passport, you have to have various other kinds of structures in which your recognition is is allowed. I mean, they included, for example, even things like union membership and and many other other categories. Now, it is it is the uh, the conversion, if you like, of a certain. I mean, in the first place, the juice solely thing, I mean, is that not everybody is a citizen any longer. You know, citizenship constitutes a further, further set of requirements uh, that, are, that are sort of digitally defined. And your ability to become a citizen is actually a, a, a work in progress. It's something that has to, has to happen. And only in that, you know, one problem that arises is that when you're in that kind of space, you are in that dangerous zone, which the Puttaswami judgment actually goes into at some length, you know, in terms of this idea of civil death, what happens, you become vulnerable, you become actually a victim, a potential victim, because, you know, your identity has that, that possibility of, of it being, being sort of switched off, which was, I think, I mean, and something I was actually interested in, the situation of the migrants in the context of the first lockdown, who actually became non-people, uh, and I mean, they became non-people for a particular reason, which is that Aadhaar, which was the only manner in which they could prove that they belonged to the village to which they wanted to return to, and that was the only thing they were permitted to do, they couldn't do that because Aadhaar was giving their workplace as their as their address, so they were literally, and, and there is actually a structure now that 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 defines this. That's so 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 there is a certain problem that I think that re relates to the citizenship question. That that's one point, and the second I think related point is that uh, Aadhaar, let us remember, is actually not about citizenship. It is about residence, and it is actually a a biological structure. You know, it it says that you are in an almost Agambenian sense, defined by your bare, bare you know, self. I mean, it is your biometrics, your fingerprints that define you, not your caste, not any other cultural marker. It is a deculturalized, desacralized body that defines it. And, and that is crucial because that is then the conduit through which the body is, so to say, acultured through the process of recognition. I think that that methodology is something that probably is crucial to citizenship. And I think that, you know, when you actually take that back to the kind of questions that people like Kothari were thinking about, I think you get another way of understanding. Uh, you should definitely come in because we can take it to another direction. <laughs> it's a, it's a direct, so long ago yeah. that I actually had to see the title of my paper just now to remember what the argument was. Uh, I just want to give a, a, a contextual um, reference to why I called it contemporary cultural practice, some polemical categories. This was written with, at, at a moment where I was addressing an audience in Havana. I was, it was, a, it was a, a, the, in the fourth Havana Biennale and I was invited to speak there amongst some of the very fine Latin American um, uh, art theorists, art historians, critics, and theorists. And um, it was addressed to a debate, this, that Biennale was called tradition and modernity. And that was the reigning paradigm, as it were, not only in, in, in India, of course, but in all post-colonial uh, social um, uh, contexts. And this was the discursive, um, discursive, uh, uh, space was 
as it were defined by the two words, tradition and modernity. And it seemed to me that we had got completely locked that Havana in 1989 was proposing this as a proposition to be seriously discussed across Latin America and Africa and Asia. There were not very many Asians speaking there, but uh, primarily these two other continents. So um, I think there it was indeed a polemical position that mm -hmm. I took that to give up to, for the moment, suspend the terms tradition and modernity and to use the term contemporary. It was entirely polemical. It was not that I was not interested in the question of modernity, even in, the, in 1989, I was, and that got manifest over the decades in, in the, then the book that I wrote when was modernism, but it was polemical within a context, within a moment uh, of, con, uh, of, um, a collaborative thinking once again after so many decades uh, on tradition and modernity. So that was the one, uh, that was a, a way out of this lock. Um, in my book in 2000, When Was Modernism, there was a subtitle to it, Contemporary Cultural Practice in India. And so I had here very consciously put when was modernism and then added a sub subtitle contemporary cultural practice. And um, here, I think I was wanting to um, contain the term, and this, is, this can be obviously crit critiqued. I was trying to contain the term contemporary within the modern. I, my ruling paradigm at that point was the modern, modernity, Moderni modernization is not my, my concern in that it's a sociological uh, track, but um, modernism. And so I was containing the term contemporary within it as a way of um, um, allowing for exits from the, um, from, the, from the strictures of the modern, from the strictures of modernism. Um, there is um, a term there which I have used then subsequently in a much more, I think, creative and energetic way, the word conjuncture, which I think that um, was contained in that title, contemporary, cult uh, contemporary Cultural Practice, but I think I moved on to the idea of the contemporary as conjunctural, which this, which, um, it makes a reference to its historicity, but becomes then a moment within that historical trajectory. So I think that subsequently I would have used the word, unlike the essay here, I would use it conjuncturally. And um, that allows me to retain two categories for which I'm heavily critiqued and uh, Shuddha is sitting in front of me, which is the national and modern I'm uh, the victim of much, uh, what shall we say? Uh, I won't use a heavy word for what, the, what Shuddha and Jibesh, uh, the Raks feel about this national modern um, fix that I have. But I think that uh, there are ways to use the national and national modern, national hyphen modern in ways that is still possibly of some interest. And I think that if I'm not misunderstood, Madhav in some senses was using those two terms and that he was using them not hyphenated, but as uh, mutually critiquing. And that he had problematized this via the question of democracy and the questions that are raised by the, uh, the, by the uh, understandings and misunderstandings of the word um, democracy. I wanted to return to the book to mention that, um, well, two things. I wanted to say one anecdotal thing. Um, in 2001, there was an exhibition, the opening of the Tate Modern um, uh, had an exhibition which invited curators to um, choose one city in the 20th century, which uh, according to their own uh, histories, art histories, and contemporary uh, cultures would give them a, 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 a perspective on what the 20th century, how the 20th century was uh, unfolding, and what were the 
conjunctural moments in the form in, in within the format format of a city that would be considered to be the defining features of 20th century modernism. And um, I and Ashish uh, curated the exhibition, uh, the, the section on India, and we debated precisely something which came up today. The, we, we wondered whether we should take the 1940s in India or the 1990s. And we selected 1990s for fairly um, uh, simple reasons, because we would have access to material in a way that we wouldn't have for the 1940s. That is material in terms of actual art, art, uh, uh, artists' works and um, and their contextual um, uh, their their contexts. Um, so it is it is interesting that in 2001, Ashish and I chose. Bombay and the 90s as the defining moment for us in terms of the questioning of the uh, the que uh, questioning modernism in India or questioning the 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 relationship of Indian modernism to all um, important sites in the 20th century across the world. I just want to end this little interjection by saying that. Uh, Ashish's design of the book is absolutely extraordinary. It is it is a blast, and it's uh, it's anarchic in a way that just takes my breath away. And he's got these um, no, no, he's got this tele uh, this monitor which uh, intersperses almost every essay or throughout the book it appears. But that monitor is is uh, is complete chaos. And so there is a frame and there is chaos. So that there is a definite framing device and then the frame is being blasted. Uh, and what I appreciated very much is the recurrence of Ghatak falling. And the, uh, the, that, that, that um, I don't even want to call it symbolic. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a configuration of the imaginary in terms of self-incited, um, it's not a suicide, it's a, it's a mm, self-incited death in, 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 in terms of historical mortality. And the fact that that is the continuing feature in the book and that my essay, you use it, is particularly gratifying for me because of my um, interest at one time and my my desire to write on Yukti Thakur and Gappo, where in fact this occurs. And where I think more than any other film where he would be dealing with historical memory, retrieval, and um, and even mourning. In Yukti Thakur Gappo, he's directly addressing the contemporary. He is He belongs to the contemporary and he fails to belong to it. And that is the moment that he died. So that that uh, figure is. I'm grateful that that figure was introduced in the book and is used in my essay. Thanks. Thank you, Agita. It's a it's a great way to close. We have been here two hours. <laughs> People have been listening in from all over the world, and uh, so we are extremely grateful. And I think it's a kind of radical defamiliarization of the 90s, both in terms of design and concepts. And thank you all uh, for, for your patience and your interest and your curiosity. Please do pick up the book if you can. And uh, thank you, everyone. Goodbye. This ends the session. <laughs>